will probably say something that your audience overall will strongly disagree with, but I'm going to just put it out there anyways. The thing is, is like, if you're afraid going into the recession, that's a you thing. Because there are people who are fucking stoked to go into the recession. Today, we have an absolute banger interview from none other than Alex Hormozzi. This man's portfolio of companies makes $100 million in revenue per year. He's come to bring us his meat and potatoes approach to success, regardless of market conditions. That's right, the recession is the time that the richest and most powerful people are licking their lips and getting prepared to buy absolutely everything at a fire sale. And so if you're looking to join in on that game, the first step is to expand your capital so that you can join in on this absolutely insane buyer's market. If you're excited, smash that like button and let's jump into this interview with Alex Hormozzi. Mr. Alex Hormozzi, thank you so much for coming on the channel. Uh, I'm sure everyone has seen your videos. They've been absolutely killer of late. So if you have been missing any of Alex's content, please go check it out. But you know, I want to start with some more general concepts. What is what is success? What does it mean? What is success to you? You said right before you hopped on that you're going to ask this question. And I was like, I really hope I have a good answer for this. <laughs> uh, but I, um, I think it is leaving no more potential in the system. And that's just depending on whatever, you know, whatever outcome you're going against. And that I, I guess would be from a material perspective. But if you just go on a, on a holistic from a personal perspective, if you die with all of your potential realized, to me, that would be successful. That's a great answer. It also is a very, very difficult to define, I guess, very personal answer is, is the other thing. So I guess is success just completely personal? Yeah, 100%. So what motivates you? What, what would motivate Alex? Um, I do things that make me feel good. And I do that over the long haul rather than the short haul, because I think I, I get more net feeling good of something that I have accomplished because I get to think about it for the rest of my life rather than the short period of time that was sac you know sacrificing to get there. But I think that the more closely you can associate the sacrifice with the outcome, then it stops being a sacrifice. If, if you just like the game, right? Like I play the game because I enjoy the game. I come from a fitness background. So this, this analogy might make sense. A lot of times in the fitness world, there's a bunch of dudes and gals who are like really in shape and are like, you guys need to be more disciplined. You guys need to, you know, do what's, do the hard stuff, blah, 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 right? But those same people don't do the hard stuff in their businesses. And it's because they actually just love fitness. And so they do something that is hard for other people. And so then they claim a virtue that they do not have because what they are really doing is just doing something they enjoy, right? To them, they look forward to going to the gym. Other people don't look forward to going to the gym. And so, but because other people don't look forward to it, they claim that they are lazy when in reality, both of them just do the shit they like. And so if you can change the things you like or gain more affinity around actions, like I am fortunate in that I love business. So like I draw pictures about business. I write books about business. I make videos about business. And when I'm not doing that, I actually run businesses because I love business. It's what I think about on our dates. I'm like, man, I can't wait to think what our projections are going to be in 24 months, like in our most romantic moments, because that's what I'm so I'm excited about. Right. That's that's so, peak romance, man. I mean, that's me. I, I like this stuff. I'm fortunate that I like this. The moment I tasted business, I didn't stop. I didn't want to do anything else. If you're going to be the best at something, like you have to like it. If you don't naturally like it, then you're probably just not going to be the best. Like, and I think that then we start having to just sing, like, maybe we shift expectations around because most of the discontent that people experience is because their expectations are different than reality. And so it's like, you can either change reality or you can change your expectations. They're both hard to change, but like one of them in some, you know, with a little bit of mental work is easier than the other. So how do you define happiness? What is happiness? Oh man, we're just getting just some right hooks. Well, um, I, I just, I just want to get like a context before we dive into like yeah, the nitty gritty yeah, yeah, yeah. or the actionable stuff. I just kind of want to like people to understand where your headspace is because yeah. I find, I find your content super actionable, but I always think to myself, like what, motivates this guy? Like, where does he come from? You know? Yeah. So I define success as maximizing my potential. The things that motivate me are that I enjoy the things that I do. And so all of my day is oriented around maximizing those things. And I just happen to enjoy things that have a long-term compounding benefit. So I had a, um, a mentor who's like a long time ago who I said, I just had like a really great weekend. And uh, she was like, I'm pretty sure life is about stringing as many of those days in a row as you can. And that was like the most tactical explanation that I got about like how to live life. And so there's the whole, like, if you were to die tomorrow, would you live the same way? No, of course not. But th because everything, cause like, you're really then just checking boxes of like every last thing I needed. It basically goodbyes is, is what you're, is what you're accomplishing there. But if you were going to live for like five years more, right. Or 10 more years, would you change much? And for me, no, because like, 
where my hours go today, like I spend my time writing the books because I those are really meaningful for me. And if I were to die in 10 years, I would want to have those written, right? And like the businesses, I have duty to all the families of the thousands of employees across our portfolio companies that like I have duty there and I feel obliged to, 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 to carry that out. So anyways, all that to say, motivation, success, and happiness to me are all interwoven in terms of how I allocate my time. And I'll add one more thing on here because I think a definition of strategy is important. So a lot of people are like, you need to be strategic with your life, like strategic with your decisions, but like what the fuck is strategy? So strategy is how you choose to allocate limited resources against unlimited opportunities. That's all it is. And so it's like, we have X hours, X money, X skills. These are our assets. These are our resources. And there's a hundred or a thousand or a million things we could put them towards. And so we have to learn how to say no to basically everything. And most of strategy is saying no and only saying yes one or two times for a decade. <laughs> Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, so in my position as a content creator, uh, yeah. when the bull run sort of happened, I got, you know, all kinds of celebrities, people, brands reaching out going, hey, like we heard you're the NFT guy, we heard you're the crypto guy, like we want to get involved. And um, like it all was a waste of time, all was a waste of time, every single one. And I saw you actually did a video on, on sort of shiny objects. And, and it's funny, you said like the shiny objects don't go away, they only get shinier. And I thought that was a pretty interesting one. Um, and yeah, my, my sort of policy is just just like everything that's gone right in my career has been self-generated and uh, there's never been a shortcut. Like all the shortcuts end up being like sort of long cuts. It's it's just, it's a shame, but you have to experience those scars uh, to, to actually learn that or, or else of course you're gonna, you're gonna think it's a, a good opportunity. Um, I have a really interesting question because you know, you come off very self-assured, very clear-minded in your in your direction. Most of the people I meet have experienced some degree of imposter syndrome, of not feeling like they were actually worthy of doing the thing that they're doing. Have you ever experienced that? And sort of like, how did you deal with it? And if you have, what was the moment where you maybe feel like you've made it or do you still deal with it? Um, transparently, no. And I know that that's not common. I have always been the biggest advocate of evidence over everything, which is, do I have proof? If I'm going to give myself my word, then I want it to be backed with something, right? A lot of people have fiat word. It's all make-believe, right? I want my word to be backed, right? And so I use evidence of shit I have done in the past. And so what most people do is they bite off more they can chew or they try and flex or front or position something. And they know the way they're saying it is actually making it seem a little bit different than it really was. Mm -hmm. Because you feel like an imposter because the, the second part of that is what if someone finds out that I haven't really done this stuff, mm -hmm. which basically means I'm lying to pretend I'm further along. And the thing is, is you don't fool the people who have game. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has game sees right through you. So you're only fooling people who don't mean anything. And then as soon as they do understand, they do see you and then you do lose credibility for sure. But if you do it the other way where you have the evidence, you can just say, this is my evidence, take it or leave it. These are the things that I found. Hopefully it provides value to you. And then there is no room for an imposter syndrome because you're doing it all off of the facts that you have done, which came from work, which is the long cut. Where do you start, right? Um, where do you start building your evidence? Because I know that, you know, for me, one of my first experiences with just saying like, screw it, I'm gonna do something, was I was in college, I was in uh, my second year of college and I really got into electronic music. I wanted to be a part of it. And yeah. music with a capital M was just too intimidating, right? It was super intimidating, yeah. but I just decided I was just gonna start playing with it. And a year and a half later, I was touring as an artist, right? And I just saw how quickly just obsession and just pushing yourself into stuff could just yeah. re net results if you had a very specific goal. And then from that point on, getting into coding, getting into whatever it might be, was just like, whatever, I've done this. I've done this process of sucking really badly at something and then just overcoming it and then getting to the point where public's validating it. And so I had that experience and I'm thankful for it. Um, music was just a, a, it was just an example of it. But I don't know, if, you know, what would you say is like the right way for people to sort of start? Like evidence transfers. So it's like, because as soon as the evidence of a thing you did transfers to a character trait, you can then say, I have evidence of this trait mm -hmm. because the traits are transferable across. Like, Winners win. Mm -hmm. Where like if I started doing singing, I probably wouldn't be good in the beginning, but I'll bet you I'd be pretty darn good in two years. It's not something I find interesting, right? But if I did, you know what I mean? Like I know I'd probably be pretty good at it because I know that I can, I could, I have the traits because I have evidence that I can continue to do that. So like, how does somebody who doesn't have the traits, right? They haven't, they haven't done anything successfully is that I think you just have to do the things that you know you can do. And most people, if they look at their history, there's multiple narratives. Part of it is they're believing other shit that their mom, their parent, their dad, or whatever is telling them. Right. And they're listening to that narrative rather than their own. Most people have shit they love and they've been told that they're not supposed to love that or whatever. But like when we're talking about those things, you have tons of work ethic. Mm -hmm. 
because you spend all this time doing it. So it's like you have evidence. And then the caveat to your evidence is I can spend tons of time doing this if I like it. So it's like, cool. Then I just have two caveats to my evidence and then I can do that. Now, over time, you can start removing the caveats and be like, I can do shit for a long time, even if I don't like it. Because I like the other long thing even more. Let's let's focus on today, right? It's 2022. We're yeah. looking at a really weird situation in the economy, in the world. How do you approach business differently today? And what would you do if you were starting out and say, I don't know when you started your journey and if you were you know, young 20s or late teens or whenever you consider yourself a beginner, what would you do to someone starting qu- like quite at the beginning at this yeah. stage in the economy, looking at a potential recession, looking at assets yeah. and bonds and everything falling in tandem? Like, how would you begin a journey today? Okay, I'm pulling three pieces out of what you just said. One is what I would do, which I think is honestly not relevant to the audience. Like I'm stacking tons of cash and I'm gonna be looking for opportunistic big companies that went from you know 50 million top line to 38 million top line and I will be able to buy a meaningful chunk and crush that business in, in, a, in a meaningful way over the next five to 10, right? Like that's what I'm looking for. You don't have my deal flow, you don't have my capital, so not relevant. Second is what you mentioned with bonds, assets, you know, things like that. I will probably say something that your audience overall will strongly disagree with, but I'm going to just put it out there anyways. I think that most people get too aggressive on thinking that that's going to get them rich when the things that make you rich are internal, not external. And so I would rather somebody take $500,000 and not put it into bonds and crypto and stocks that they're picking or day trading or whatever it is. And think if I had $500,000, what skills could I add to my skill toolkit to make more money forever? Because like 500 grand, if you 10 exit, cool is 5 million. But a $500,000 skill set that you invest $500,000 in is going to pay you $5 million a year for life. Because like every dollar you put in you, A, you can't trade out of it, right? Like it's it forces people to have a long-term investment that always compounds, right? Second, it has yield, right? So like you literally get cash flow from the investment that you made in yourself, yep. right? And then you yourself, you appreciate. Yep. And it's 100% tax efficient. So if you're looking at the lens of how you look at an investment, you look at yield, you look at appreciation, you look at downside protection, and you look at tax efficiency. If you actually looked at yourself as an asset through that lens, it is the best asset class you can put money into because it then flows into everything else. But people don't want to do that because it's so much easier to say, hey, I bought this coin and it 100 x or whatever. But what everyone else is seeing now is there's a reason that they call it risk and reward, mm-hmm. is that most people who are poor underestimate risk. That's why lottery people are poor people, right? Because they understand that they have basically 100% likelihood of hitting the downside, but a one out of 100 shot, rich people do the exact opposite. They'd rather have 100% chance of getting 10%. For me, I'd rather everyone cash out, cash into themselves, and then know that no matter what environment, if you have skills, independent of currency, you can trade skills for crypto, you can trade it for an inflated dollar, it is a hedge against inflation. Yep. Yeah, I think that's an amazing point. And especially like obviously during the wildest bull run of all of our lifetimes. Yeah, take some risk. Personally, I think that was the right play. Right now, we're looking at an undefined amount of time of stagnation in the economy, which is why a new type of investment is necessary. And a new type of content, I think, is the the smart content to be creating, which is how do you invest in yourself so that you are no longer chained to the fluctuations of the economy, but that economy fluctuating in any direction just allows you more opportunity, like you were saying, right? You're saying, I love these companies crashing because it gives you the opportunity to do what everyone who's built in crazy wealth can do. But what part of the economy do you think is most relevant or do you think it's not not relevant to think like that. Um, if you're hardcore on something, you're pretty much always going to win. Like if you if you just like I love this thing, if you do it for long enough you're going to win. Like notwithstanding very stupid examples that someone can probably try and think of, but like 99% if you do the thing you like, you'll be okay. Flip side is I don't know what I want, right? Then in that case, by all means go for the opportunity because I'm actually pretty in favor of in the short term not doing stuff you like. Because most times you don't really know what you like because you're not good at anything and you like stuff you're good at. And sometimes you don't have the opportunity to know what you're good at until you've tried a couple things. And so that's why I'm actually a huge favor of like tiny business opportunities. Like, you know, people who go and find businesses or creators and like make eBooks for them, right? Or, you know, video editing, right? Let's look at trends. Video, video is blowing up. There's a huge demand for it, not enough supply. Like if you started editing videos tomorrow, you'd probably have a full roster. So like that's a, that's a short term thing that will eventually get 
you know, the, the supply demand curve will shift back, but you'll probably have three years that you, it'll be pretty easy to get business even in a recession. And so um, there's the macro trends and then there's the, the internal stuff. But if I were somebody brand new, probably doesn't know what they like, starting a tiny little side business or business while you still have your main job, which I think is a good idea, I think is a good way of learning all the aspects of a business. You have to learn how to get business. You have to learn how to sell. You have to learn how to deliver. You have to learn how to hire. Like there's all these little skills. And what happens is you might be like, you know what? I love the getting business part, or I love the sales part, or I love the making the client experience part and like over delivering on that. Like if I could just do that all day, well, it's like, then you get a lot more context into like, Hey, you could start a business around that. Or it gives you a lot of career progression because if you get really good at any aspect of a business, you can immediately line yourself up into a director role at most businesses and make six or multiple six figures a year. Do you think content is a required skill at this point uh, for an entrepreneur? I don't think it's a required skill. I say that because I have evidence that it's not a required skill to make money. Like if you have a massive outbound team, you don't need to make content, you make a lot of money. Um, if you know how to make ads or basically hire people to make ads, you don't need to, you need to have it. If you know how to go recruit affiliates, you don't need to have it. Like if you have an amazing product that gets referrals and people keep using it, buy and love it and share it, you don't need it. But is it is it something that if you make content most and you're good at it, all the other ones spin faster? Yes. What do you think are the the skills, I guess, in sort of a recessionary economy that someone focusing on what you're saying, focusing on investing in themselves, focusing on simple things, right, that aren't necessarily the shiny objects of, of the last 10 years, right? You don't need to code the next, you know, hit app, right? You don't need to, you know, you don't need to uh, invent a new, like, you know, bioscience type, like yeah. medicine or whatever. Someone who's just going to get down to basics and work. What are three things you think they need to do? What are things you think that they should be checking off and doing each day to make sure that they're staying on the path? Because in my opinion, when you go out and you actually try to create your own success, there's no checklist that anyone gives you. And most of the checklists that these sort of like success people give you are kind of like just bullshit for content, you know, sure. and, and it's just like, okay, cool. That's a cool video. But how does that apply to my life? What yeah. do you think are the real sort of things that are like, hey, if you've done this in a day, you can sleep easy? There's, there's three basically big functions in a business, right? Like from a value perspective, you've got the promotion, which is the marketing and the sales. You've got the product itself, which is what is the thing that we're selling? And you've got the people, right? You could also consider back of house like finance if, you, if you're into that. But most people who are on the finance path are probably not in this situation. So I'll just cut them out of there. They, they have a job and they either like it or they don't, but they're making money. Um, and so it's like either you're a people person who learns how to manage, operate, and lead. Right. Like, and that's what you love. You love the people, you love building people, you love the development side, you love recruiting, like you love all of these kind of components of like the running the day to day, which is a skill that's incredibly valuable. It's the execution side of every business. Right. The other two are promotion and product. Right. So you've got the marketing and the sales side. Like, what does that mean if you market? It's like, well, we just went over eight different ways you can market. Right. It's like you can get affiliates, you can get referrals, you can get agents, you get other people, you can teach other people how to do it. You can get, you can do cold outbound, you can do warm outbound, you can do paid ads, and uh, and you can make content. There you go. There's eight ways that you can get customers. And so, all right, if that's, if there's the eight ways, pick one, right? Like, and get good at it. There you go. Like, <laughs> it takes so few skills to make money but people can't tackle the uncertainty of not knowing which to do. You just have to pull the thread and assume you'll learn the other ones over time. Just start at one corner of the puzzle, start where the faces and the lines add up, which is like, okay, I kind of understand what warm outreach looks like. I'll start doing that to people, right? Or I'm gonna start doing content, okay, cool. Or I'm gonna start running ads, okay, cool. I'll go start recruiting affiliates, okay, cool. Like whatever one you pick, doesn't matter, pick one. And then you get good at that through reps. And my my rule of thumb with this is 100 actions a day. So whatever it is. So if it's 100 cold calls, 100 cold emails, 100 voicemail drops, for me on the ad side, it'd be like $100 a day of advertising. If it was content, it'd be 100 minutes of content a day. Like just like, what's my, what's my action? What's my action that I can take? You do that every day. And if you're not doing those things, you're not getting new business. Like those are, they're the core actions that have to occur in a business. If they're not happening. You're not making money. Yeah. I, I like the hundred a day uh, concept. It, it's something that you can really apply to anything. So that's a really useful tip for me. It's more just conceptual, right? Because I would say you're in a very realistic and we're in a very idealistic space, right? The idealism of the space is partly what has attracted me to it. And partly sure. what I think is one of the biggest fundamental features and flaws, right? So you have the, the feature of the space, which is it's idealistic 
it's progressive, it, it holds these promises. And then you have also the idealism, which doesn't always get lived up to as what, what we've just seen, which is one of the biggest, you know, in my opinion, sort of like tragedies that we've just seen of the space. And so you have the idealism and the realism. And I think that the people who live in an idealistic space, but approach it with a realistic path, like what you're saying, are the ones that are going to crush it over time, because they're the ones who say, I don't care, I'm going to go control my world and continue doing these activities each day. And I'm going to insulate myself from the things I can't control. And those are the people who like are looked back on as lucky or whatever. And that's great. But in the end, the people inside the space know that those people are just heads down working and controlling what they can do. But I think it's really important just to focus on the balance there. How important even in your world is idealism is ethos or ideas in general versus just here's evidence, here's actions, here's data. You know, it's funny. It's like you only need like one or two good ideas every five years. So the ideas are important, but what do you do for the rest of your five years is the actions. What if, what advice are you getting and, and what's a good example if you can share? Oh, just like, uh, you know, us doing all the short stuff was like somebody being like, I think shorts are going to be big. And we were like, OK, cool. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let's make a lot of shorts. Right. And then like, oh, you need to restructure your uh, repackage your YouTube videos a certain way. We started doing it the next week and then we immediately saw a two and a half X increase on our views. Just like, OK, if they said it works, let's give it a shot. Let's go. And I think um, so this is going to be really good for your audience. Definitions are important, which is why we started. But I think there are a couple other definitions that need to be had. The first is the definition of learning. The second will be the definition of intelligence. All right. So learning is same condition, new behavior, which means that if you were exposed to the same stimulus and your behavior does not change, it means you did not learn. And you can think about your own life. If you're going back and so the same thing happens and then the same and then you behave the same way, it means you did not learn. So if you consume a piece of content and then nothing changes in your life, you wasted your time. Hmm. Like that is learning. You go to a workshop, you read a book and then afterwards your behavior doesn't change. You learn nothing. Hmm. So that is the definition of learning from a behavioral perspective. Intelligence is a rate. It is the speed of learning, which means how quickly does someone change their behavior based on a new stimulus? And so a lot of people like to think that they're smart cookies because they overanalyze, but they never change their behavior, which means they're dumb cookies. Yeah, it's, oh my God, the amount of times I've seen, uh, respect to a lot of the other creators in the finance space, but the amount of times I've seen people analyze the hell out of the market and come to the wrong conclusion, and I like want to rip my hair out. I'm like, but you had all the right assumptions and you led to the wrong conclusion. It's crazy. One of the things that I think that is applicable here is the speed at which people learn to react to market movements. You know, it's like people oftentimes will experience the same sort of issues over and over again in their trading strategies. To me, it's like a scar, right? You know, like what happened to me when I lost all this money in 2018 was like a scar. And I touched that scar every day of the bull run. I went, yeah. don't go back here. And so that affected everything I did. How do you learn to like something if you don't? Like, say you just don't like business. Say you don't like fitness. Say you don't like these things, but you know you need them, right? And and it's like, I think that that's kind of the more common scenario is someone who doesn't like, you know, having their muscles ripped to pieces, who doesn't like being extremely tired and overcoming, you know, exhaustion and, and hyperventilation. Like, how do you like the intensity of, of, of business and uncertainty, knowing that you have a percentage chance of hitting the wall, you know, like, how do you yeah. learn to like those situations if you're not inherent to it? And maybe I'm asking the wrong guy. No, I think I think I have a very good answer for this. So have you ever been to a city and been like, oh, I've been to Cincinnati. It's dog shit. Right. <laughs> and the reality is shout that, out to Cincinnati. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Cincinnati, the nasty natty. Um, if you if you go there as a human, you can only experience like you're there for what a week. You go to like 12 places to eat. Maybe you see and talk to maybe like 12 people while you're there. And then you talk to a friend. And you're like, oh, Cincinnati's terrible, whatever. And they're like, Cincinnati's the best. Right. Because they go to different restaurants. They talk to different people. And I think that's a microcosm example of when people say, like, I'm not good at business or I don't like business. You can't not like business because business is like a hundred things. Right. Like saying, like, I don't like fitness. Have you tried Pilates? Have you tried yoga? Have you tried walking? Have you tried running? Have you tried Olympic lifting? Have you tried powerlifting? Have you tried strongman? Have you tried bodybuilding? Have you tried physique? Have you like what you know, what things did you do? And then they're like, oh, I, I actually, to be fair, I actually never been to the gym. You're like, OK, so you have trouble doing things in general. This has nothing to do with fitness. And so the easiest way to figure out, like, well, I don't like business is to is to get really narrow and be like, do you not like sales? Do you not like talking to new people? Do you not like creating things? Do you like Excel sheets? Do you like project? Like there's so many aspects of business. Like 
every job fundamentally that exists in the world exists in a business. So like there's a lot of different parts of business. And so to say I don't like it is really like I haven't gone to a restaurant in Cincinnati that I liked yet. Doesn't mean there aren't one. You just got to find the restaurant that you like. And then you will keep going back because you like that place. Like how much effort does it take to keep going back to a restaurant you like? Not much. No, not much at all. Good yeah, I, I, I fundamentally agree, right? Because businesses now, ever, especially now that, that the internet has really given like a voice and a lane to even the most like random activities, like oh. <laughs> like any activity is now like a business of sorts. If as long as more than like ten people do it, you like drawing, graphic design. Like if you, I mean, like you, you know, what I mean, like you, if you like drawing, you could just do thumbnails on YouTube. Like there's so many places to do things in business that when someone says they don't like it, it's like you can't even not like business. It just it's too. There's so much stuff that I hate about business personally. Like, I don't want to do interviews all day. There are some people who love doing interviews all day. <laughs> I don't like it. There's some people who love running meetings. My wife loves running meetings. She loves it. She's like, this is what moves the company forward. And I agree with her. It totally does. I don't like doing it. Right. And so like there's a thousand flavors of business on the micro level that are the actual doingness of business. And so like if there's a million things you can do, just taste more of them until you find the one you like and then it'll get easy. Well, you, you guys heard it. Alex hates doing interviews, so please go follow his channel because he's suffering. <laughs> he's suffering through this one for us, and we really appreciate it. I mean, new um, jobs, new hires, and stuff. Oh, 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 job interviews. <laughs> no, not pocket. No, this is great. This is fun. No, no, no. I was like, I was like, definitely, give, definitely hit that bell uh, because he's 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 gritting his teeth through this one. No, um, it's really a different space that you're in, and it's fundamentally the most important. And I feel like the people who master the self battle, the internal battle, which is really what you talk about, right? You talk about your internal internal battles, right? And and it seems to me like your perspective is that if you beat your internal battles, the external battles are just non-existent. They, they don't yeah. matter. You know, in a space where almost everything is externalized, the market did this, the whales do that, the, the Fed did this, everything is externalized. And even though, you know, we make a lot of content of like, hey, if you're in profits, take them off the table or rebalance. And those are all internal emotional battles, right? Of like controlling your emotions and managing your own risk, right? Combining that mentality of winning the inner war, it makes it that in markets and business and whatever you're in control but it also feels like the thing that people it's like the vitamins like people don't want to hear about it right they're like oh well no i've been hearing about that my whole life I, i'd rather hear about something that's gonna be a solution to this like a quick solution to this and so again you know i, I think that what you teach is really important but also you know i think like it's kind of hard for people that don't have that spark and i remember not having that spark i remember just kind of being going on the lawyer path because that was what my dad was it was like oh yeah. my, my dad was a lawyer my mom told me it's a good career so i'm just gonna do this i, I talk a lot so i think i could do, be, do good at it, right? But I'm like dyslexic. I don't even like to read that much. And I realize like 99% of being a lawyer is like contract. And so it's like, okay, well, that, this is going to be hell for me. It's going to be horrible for me. I think that getting back to the basics is kind of what this point in the world is all about. Do you think very much about the future? Do you think very much about the way the economy is going to be in five, 10 years? Do you think about like the direction of the world? Or is that just stuff that you just kind of cast aside and, and focus I, on what you do? Yeah, I take a page out of, you know, Warren's book, Warren, Warren Buffett, which is, we look at the things that are important and knowable. Is the future of the economy important? Hell yeah. Is it knowable? Nope. Yep. It's like we look at the controllables. So I do I actually think about anything? Like, do I think about the Fed? Do I think about the economy as a whole? Honestly, no, never. I really don't. Because I, I have no control over it. I, I just genuinely, I just don't, I don't think about it. And it's funny because like while you were talking about um, like most people don't want to listen to that stuff. It's like, yeah, that's why most people are poor. Like it makes sense. You know what I mean? Like most people are victims. And so mm -hmm. they attribute all of their life to external circumstances. So they will listen more to the things that talk about the external circumstances so they can absolve themselves of any accountability. Right. So you can say, it's not my fault. It's their fault. Right. But like the thing is, is like, if you're afraid going into the recession, that's a you thing. Cause there are people who are fucking stoked to go into the recession because they know that all of their weaker competitors are gonna go out of business. They're gonna gain way more market share. The assets that they get per dollar of cash they have just doubled. If you just were to remove the word recession and say, would you like a scenario where the weaker competitors in your market go out of business, all of your dollars buy twice as much stuff, would you not want that? Of course you'd want that, right? Of course you'd want that. But the only people who want that are people who aren't worried about what happens when the tide goes out using you know, Warren Buffett's language to see who's skinny dipping. Because a lot of people, and probably if we're being real, a lot of people on your channel were skinny dipping. The tide was up, no one knew that they had their pants down, right? And then they got caught because they put all their life savings into it. And I think that's the piece, 
right? Like if you t- if you get the skills and you get the character traits, it doesn't matter what the external is because people are still making money. The only people who are afraid of the recession is the bottom 30% because they're the ones who go out of business, right? Like if you got, you've got 10 gyms in a neighborhood, the recession, people are still going to use the gym. They're just not going to use the worst one. Yeah, I guess the point of the recession is to get rid of the less performing parts of the economy. If you think about it from an, from like an evolutionary standpoint and that we've seen this each and every time is that the non-functional parts of the economy or the less logical parts that aren't really serving a core purpose get eliminated. And if you're a fan of capitalism, well, that's kind of the goal of the economy is to get is to keep the stuff people actually value with their dollars and vote for with their dollars. It's super interesting uh, this time in the economy. And what I really want to focus on is just that ability for people to transform themselves now more than ever, because this is a point where people are put into a fear mindset as opposed to an opportunity mindset. Whereas a year ago, everyone was trying new things. Everyone was a new expert at something new. And now everyone's scared and everyone's worried and everyone's in a defensive posturing, which is really the time where the sharks get hungry and the whales go out to eat. Yeah. So fun fact, there's, I think there's 8,000, I want to say it's either, I think it's 8,376 hours in a year. Right. And so if you divide how much you make by 8,300, you get your actual dollars per hour. And it's for most people surprisingly low when they actually do that math. They're like, oh, shit, I don't make as much money as I thought. And so I think the first thing that happens when you do that mental equation, if you want, you can divide it by 10,000 just for like simple math. Right. You realize that you probably aren't working the vast majority of the hours that you have access to work. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, number one, increase your volume of input. Right. So like if so. To have an output in a system, you have input times leverage equals output, right? That's what it is. So the number of activities and then how much you get per activity equals output. And so the first thing is that most people haven't maximized their input. Step one, maximize input. So if you're only working 40 hours, work 80. And here's what's cool is that everybody also got a raise during the recession. Whatever you're making, it's now worth more because everything else is cheaper, right? Like if money has no backing, it is only has value in as it relates mm-hmm. to other things. And if all the asset classes, at least from an investment perspective, have gone down, your dollars are worth more. So everybody should get more excited about working because you just got a raise, which is cool, right? And then leverage is how much I get per unit. So how do I increase what I get per unit of time? So that's going to be doing higher value skills, like the graphic designer, right? Mm-hmm. The guy who likes drawing. It's like, okay, what are the things that you can draw? You can draw ads for businesses. You could draw YouTube thumbnails. You could do icons. You could do logo design. Like there's so many different things. Now, is there one of these that is probably more valuable? I'll bet you that knowing how to design ads that convert, very valuable skill set. Mm-hmm. And then you go to people who spend millions of dollars a month, extremely f-ing valuable skill set. Mm-hmm. And so this is strategy, right? I have these resources and assets, these skills, how do I allocate it against unlimited options? Well, I could draw a cartoon book or I could draw ads same day to day for me, but I can sell it for a hundred times more. Inputs are fixed once you maximize them. And then I get leverage on where I'm choosing to allocate it. And so that's where getting smart about what are other people who have my skill set have? How are they making five times more than I am per unit time? Let me see what they're doing, right? So I think it's both of those things. Most people aren't working nearly enough and that's because they're downtrodden, whatever. It's like, well, increase your liquidity during this time period by increasing your inflow of cash by working more, step one. Step two, make more per unit of time, and then realize that this whole time you're getting 30, 50% double on your money. What What were the moments that were your big like unlocks, right? Because I've, I've definitely had my big unlocks. Like I said, the first one was when I decided to just pick up a random skill while I was a student in college. Turned out I could make a career out of it. Realized I didn't want to make a career out of it because uh, yeah. I started meeting like the top, top people in, in the field and realizing that they were kind of a total mess. And I was like, well, I don't want to work towards being a mess, right? Like yeah. um, I sort of fast forwarded in my head. I was like, well, what if I'm 40 and this is my life? Like this yeah. actually seems like a nightmare. Well, it seems quite cool as a sophomore in college. It actually seems like a nightmare when you're trying to think of how to like, you know, that your your job would start at, you know, 3 a.m. on a, you know, on, on a random day in, in a random country. That uh, that to me was a clear unlock that, okay, I built a skill, I had monetized it, and I also hated it, and I was happy to start over. What were the, what were the big unlocks for you if you could boil them down, if you remember them? And, oh, I totally do. The yeah. scariest decision I ever made in my life was when I quit my consulting job. Scariest decision. Hardest decision I had to make. How old were you? I, had, I was 20, 22. So, I mean, that may sound silly to some people, but like I had done, I, you know, I graduated three years magnum body from Vanderbilt. I did my two years of consulting. I had above uh, Harvard's average GMAT score so I could get in. Like I had all the things that I was supposed to do. Um, but for me, it was like, to your point, I played it out. I was like, well, the only reason I would, I knew I wanted to make a million dollars a year. That's what I wanted to make. And so, and then I realized that if I wanted to make a million dollars a year, I had to be making somebody else $10 million a year. 
Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I'd so much rather be that guy. And if I'm going to get paid a million dollars a year, they're not going to let me live the life I want to live. They're going to squeeze every, every drop of life out of me. And that didn't sound fun. But I looked at the guys at Goldman, I looked at the guys at McKinsey, which was kind of like the next path for me after that. I was like, I don't like either of these scenarios. And to your point, I actually saw somebody else there who was in their fifties and I saw their life and I was like, I don't want that. And so it then became a best case, worst case, right? Which is like, all right, Best case, I do this thing and I just don't hate my life. That would be a great scenario that's best, better than my current one. Worst case, I do it, I fail, and I always have this shitty path here if I want to come back to it. But like, it's not like I'm going to have trouble getting back into this you know, career path. Some people are like, don't have a plan B. If you have a plan B, you didn't commit to plan A. I don't work that way. I need to have a plan B to do plan A. And that's how I am. And that's why I don't like the absolutes. Like by all means, you need to commit to plan A, but I think not understanding what plan B looks like is dumb. And then I think you can play more aggressively if you know what plan, like if you really spell it out. Like for me, I was like, okay, my actual plan B was drive Uber and strip. I've said this before, like a hundred percent. Cause I knew I'd make $400,000 a year stripping and driving Uber. Hundred like I, I it was a hundred percent my plan B because I also realized that if I made that, I could save the cash and I could try again. That That is the best response I think I've ever heard for a plan B. Yeah, my plan B was, I mean, I, I know this is silly to say, but my plan B was in elite law school. And uh, and, <laughs> and that also sounds really like a dickish thing to say uh, because, uh, but that's just what it was. Better. Yeah, The better you get, your plan B gets better. That's what's interesting. So like once I learned how to sell, because I didn't know how to sell. So if you have no skills, I was in shape and I had work ethic and I was free. So Uber, I could do with most of my time. And at night I would go to a gay strip club and strip because they paid better. But once I learned how to sell, that no longer was my plan B. Sales was my plan B. I was like, no matter what, I can go sell mortgage or sell cars, sell solar, whatever. I could sell any of those things and make multiple six figures a year and not have to take my clothes off. Cool. So that's the new plan B. Once I learned how to market, a hundred grand a month became my new plan B because I could do a turnkey sales team. So people just got to get better plan Bs. And I think sometimes if people actually really spelled it out, like the real spell out is I have to go back to where I was raised and sleep in my room with my parents there. And yes, is it humiliating? Absolutely. But is it damaging? No. No. Like that's the, the worst case is your ego gets hurt. Mm -hmm. That's your worst case. Your ego gets hurt. And for me, I would rather take a shot for the dream that I want to have, the life that I want to lead, than never take it because of my little fucking ego. So what do you do for fun uh, besides work? Because I know work is fun for you, but is, do you, like, there's got to be some part of you when you're drinking that you're not doing spreadsheets. <laughs> you, don't do, you don't do a shot and then you know, do a calculation. Like, what, is, <laughs> what is fun for you and, and what do you do besides this? Because I mean, I, I do find it super fascinating um, being this obs obsessed with success and I am as well, but I also do have like the, the side of me that, that does decompress. Like, what do you do to like, what, how do I humanize you here? Oh, um, rough time on this one. Um, <laughs> I work and I work out. And when I'm not doing that, I recover from working and working out, which for me is usually movies and TV. Cool. So that's my that's my thing. I'll watch fantasy shows and vampires and werewolves and witches and fa fairies and all, all that shit. Nice. I love anything fantasy. I'm a huge fan of sci-fi. Love that stuff. It's pure escapism. <laughs> I, <laughs> like, I love it. I watched Succession, which is like a, a show. It's like of kind of a business show. Of course. We watched that. I was like, no. I was like, I, I live this every day. I don't need to see this as my escapism. Like I want, I was like, if he became a werewolf halfway through the board meeting, I, <laughs> you know, uh, but no, like that's it. Because if work is the most fun time, which it is for me, what's not fun is when I don't feel productive because I'm like fogged. You know what I mean? I'm like, it's 12 hours in and like, I just don't feel like I'm there. Like that's not fun. And so I do what's most fun, which is like, how quickly can I recover myself so I can get back to fun time? Complete That's unplug. All. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that means taking a day. Sometimes yep. it means I don't have to take a day for two weeks. Like it just, it just depends. And so I think that that's kind of a, in the training world, there's like beginner, intermediate, advanced trainees. Like when you're advanced, you don't, you get into kind of a rhythm with yourself where you're like, I'm going to ease off a little bit today. Like I could yep. feel it. Today's a half day. Right. And I think that you get into that rhythm just over time. I mean, it makes total sense. Obviously, for me, as someone who focuses on a, on a specific niche, right? And crypto is a niche, but it also, I think the lessons in crypto are macro and, and you can really extrapolate. And then the people who are building here are doing in their own way, the daily routine and the daily grinds, right? And they're, and they're having either success or failure at it. Um, but I really appreciate all these lessons. I think if we keep going on and on and on, but I, but I want people to sort of make sure it's actionable. The key lessons here are highlighted, which is obviously just go do the work. I mean, that, I mean, 
that's what I keep hearing from you is just go do the work and show up every day and that it's not this extraordinary unlock or some sort of mystical new nutritional supplement that's going to get you there. It's the showing up and it's the unglamorous work. And this is kind of like the unglamorous time in the economy, right? And so I think it just fits, right, to be bringing that message to the world, which is that like the people who just get into the shit and are not scared of it are the ones who are just going to work their way through this. It takes 20 hours to become proficient at a new skill and it takes most people years to start the first hour. And that is the problem. Not because people are lazy, but because they are afraid of feeling stupid. Like all of the procrastination comes from ego. It's because people are too arrogant to accept that they are not good. And that comma, and that's okay. And it would be expected they, that they're not good. Like there's a Chinese proverb that says, uh, it must be hard so that it may be easy. Yep. Like you can't have it be easy unless it has first been hard. And so that's the thing is people are just afraid of that. It's just feeling stupid. That's what people are afraid of. Well, it's also one of those things of like, do you want to do something that's so easy for others to do? Because like, if you do, then like, you're kind of very vulnerable. And, um, and so I think it's one of those other sort of concepts. I believed since for about five years now that video games are the thing that actually is going to take crypto mainstream. We had no venture backing. Uh, we didn't have tremendous amount of capital. So what did we do? We started coding all day. And I started watching Udemy videos and YouTube tutorials and just doing it. And within about six months, we had a prototype and we were able to raise a small amount of VC and we were able to start going on the journey. And um, I think most people, if you said, just start coding video games, they'd say you're crazy, but it's actually as much as just doing it. And um, and I had no background. I had actually never coded before, but but I was doing some pretty cool shit in the engine by, you know, within within a few months. And so, you know, it's definitely one of those things of people always ask how to start. And it's, it's unfortunate that the answer is just to start. The most important thing, especially in this economy, is just embracing the change, just understanding whatever you're doing, you should be looking to iterate and add different things to it on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. I mean, what, what do you think is like a good time frame to be iterating? It's a hard question to answer. You know what I mean? Because like, if it's like, am I going to iterate a sales script? You might do that every few days. You know what I mean? Or you might do that every day. If it's like, am I iterating a business strategy? That might be two years. Yep. So, you know what I mean? Like, it depends on what we're talking about, which takes a little bit of self-awareness, which is one of the hardest things of making generalizations for like a large audience. Like, what's the data point? The data point on doing shit? is doing shit like did you do something <laughs> like you know what i mean like yeah so let me answer your question with a way that they can find the answer all right which is you have to boil it down to what's the fundamental activity right mm -hmm. so people are like i want to be a graphic designer what's the actual fundamental activity of graphic design there might be multiple but you can still measure those so it's like i have to generate business so i might be i have to post a hundred things on upwork okay that's the first fundamental activity. And then the fulfillment activity might be like, how many iterations I go back and forth on. Okay, those are my measurables. Cool, let me see if I can keep edging that number up. If it were coding, it might be lines of code. It might be, you know what I mean? Like everything is quantifiable from a first action perspective. Like what, are, what is the doing and how can I quantify that? If it were ads, it could be minutes, dollars per day, pieces of creative. Like there's always a quantifiable metric. It's like, well, which one's perfect? Dude, I'm doing a hypothetical for you right now. You should be able to figure it out. Like, and if you don't, then after you've done a week or two weeks of, of saying that it's dollars per day, then make it the content one and then test again. When we look at sales teams, if we want to optimize sales teams, we'll optimize comp multiple times. We'll say, let's do bonuses around close rate. Let's do bonuses around pipeline efficiency. Let's do bonuses around cash collected up front. And we will see, depending on the business, which one actually drives the most overall throughput. It's a good question what you have, which is like, what's the data we back? You got to figure out what the data is based on your industry or what you want to get into. It makes too much sense. And unfortunately, it just goes back to the the overall uh, people who work hard, who observe the data and who react to it are, are going to continue to win. Or fortunately, because thank God it is that way, because could you imagine a world where it unjustly and unfairly randomly lottery picked people? That would be the worst. <laughs> it's interesting is that I think what, what 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 that hits on is that people want a forever solution and it doesn't exist. They want a guarantee from a world that will not give it to them. They want to say, so you're just telling me if I just do this one thing, I'll be set forever. And the answer is no, because it could change. Because that's our animal brain. It's like, we don't mm -hmm. like uncertainty, right? So we like security, we like safety, and we're programmed that way because we're not programmed to thrive, we're programmed to survive. So it makes sense, right? But you have to break that. I think what you teach is fantastic and everyone just definitely, definitely go check out Alex's channel. If you have any final words, obviously you've had a lot of final words, a lot of mic drops, but if you have any final <laughs> if you have any final words for, for the good people uh, on the Elio Trades channel, we'd really appreciate it. Um, because it is based in games, I'm going to wrap it with games. And my podcast is called The Game. So like I, I love game theory and all this kind of stuff. But like it is an infinite game, not a finite game. Meaning there is no way to win an infinite game. The point of an infinite game is to keep the game going. 
And so in a finite game, there's a scoreboard, a defined period of time, known players, and agreed upon terms. Infinite games, there is no finish. The players are known and unknown, and there are no rules besides the outcome of the game, which is to keep the play game going, which means that there's only one way. You cannot win, but there's only one way to lose, which is quitting. Like the only way to lose in an infinite game is to stop. And the interesting thing is that all of the greatest pursuits in life, in my opinion, are infinite games. Your health, you don't win. The point is to keep playing. Marriage, you don't win your marriage. The point is to continue to develop the marriage, to keep playing business, you don't win. Because what? I want to be the richest man. If you look at history, no one's been the richest man the whole time they're alive. They're the richest man for a window and then it's gone. And there would be one person, right? And then that's if we're defining winning the game as being the richest versus like person who built the, the biggest uh, brand or had the most enterprise value. You know, but then it's like, well, when, the more you double click into it, the more you realize that like there isn't winning. All we're doing is we're just playing. And so I think the reason people don't win the game is because they don't even know they're playing one, right? And once you do realize you're playing it, you realize that winning isn't even the right language. It's just that you have to not stop. And so the first thing you do is start. And then once you start, you don't stop. All right, we have to end on that. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, man. Please, please keep keep enriching the world with your content uh, <laughs> because I've learned so much from it. I feel like I keep learning from it. So uh, thank you so much, everyone. Please go check out Alex's channel. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. The lessons are clear. Get actionable. Forget the things you cannot control. Keep grinding. And remember, the economy favors those who put in the work. Yes, long term, I believe crypto is going to be the land of opportunity. But if you can't sustain and grow throughout this tough time in the economy, then the crypto dream might slowly slip through your fingertips. If you enjoyed this content and you want more like it, make sure to leave a comment in the comment section below. Of course, make sure to follow Alex or Mosey. His channel is also linked in the comments below. And he really is a bottomless pit of actionable business advice. As always, I'm Elio Trades. You can find more content on Twitter at Elio Trades, and I'll see you very soon on the next episode.